The guidance that Jason was speaking about is sort of geared toward AFFF um, aqueous film forming foams. Um, however, I do want to mention that um, it can really be broadly applied to sites impacted by other types of PFAS releases as well. Um, but for um, all intents and purposes, I'll be referring to AFFF throughout the remainder of the presentation. So, um, and that's kind of because this is one of the major mechanisms of release that we, we see with, with respect to PFAS compounds. Um, it's kind of in part due to the fact that um, PFAS, I'm sorry, AFFF, when its use is necessitated, um, it can be discharged at a rate of up to like thousands of liters for each use. And so um, we find that it's a pretty significant release of PFAS oftentimes, particularly because the foam can, can contain up to 10% um, PFAS by weight itself. Um, so these foams are all somewhat different from one another. There are proprietary mix of a, potentially up to thousands of different types of PFAS compounds, um, as well as different types of surfactants, water, uh, corrosion inhibitors, and also some solvents. So a lot of different industries globally use AFFF, um, a wide variety that you can see up here, some examples. Uh, but in the US particularly, about 75% of AFFF use is um, sort of used by the, the military. And so um, they are overwhelmingly sort of the largest um, releasers of AFFF in the United States. Uh, interestingly, they're also one of the um, primary stewards of threatened and endangered species in the United States. Um, and so it's sort of that confluence of factors um, that led sort of to request this guidance be developed. Um, so, as Jason mentioned, I'm not going to go into depth with different types of, um, you know, basic PFAS chemistry, but this slide's here to show us how variable these structures can be. Um, and as we all know, structure determines sort of function and it determines the behavior in the environment. And so, um, this is just here to show us that these uh, compounds can range from very short chain to large polymers, and so um, the behavior is going to be extremely variable in the environment, and um, it's really very important to consider these compounds sort of individually for that purpose. So um, we have all of these variable types of PFAS uh, that we could talk about. There's thousands of different PFAS compounds, um, but for the guidance um, and I guess generally in ecotox, we sort of focus on the PFAAs, the perfluoroalkyl acids, and that includes um, PFCAs like PFOA, uh, as well as PFSAs uh, like PFOS. And so um, this is because those compounds are so stable and very persistent. Um, they're also abundantly used in AFFF, and so we find them very frequently at sites where AFFF has been discharged. Um, we also find that there are different PFAS precursors that degrade into PFAAs at these sites that are often also present in the AFFF. Um, there's four in particular that we have focused on um, in this guidance because of their abundance, their frequency of detection, and because they can degrade into these uh, PFAAs of concern. We also focused on this group of PFAS um, because there's, they're definitely the most well studied and so in terms of doing ecological risk that translates to tools for us um, to be able to actually assess risk. So um, that's another reason that we sort of narrowed down our guidance to focus on um, these compounds or this group of compounds. So um, I keep saying this group of compounds that we narrowed it down to and so um, how did we pick those? So. Basically, we were looking at different selection criteria. So are there methods to detect them that are reliable and accepted? Um, are they of interest to regulatory agencies? Um, for example, uh, compounds that are on the UCMR3 list. Um, is there toxicological information? Is there guidance from federal or state agencies? Um, and also, is there just a general availability of data? Is there information about their physical characteristics? Things like that. Um, so when we felt that we had sort of enough of these criteria met to include the compounds, um, they went onto our list. And so in the end of all of this, we ended up with 18 different PFAS that were included in the guidance and the model tool. And this includes 11 different P PFCAs and also an additional four PFSAs, um, including, of course, PFOS. And then it includes three 
precursors that degrade um, into these compounds as well. So um, there's a list of 18 in total, and um, like I said before, those are included in both the guidance and in the model as well. So as Jason previously mentioned, um, the conceptual site model is the first major component of a risk assessment. Um, and so all PFAS impacted sites and contaminated sites in general are somewhat unique, um, as we all know. But uh, we wanted to develop sort of a generic conceptual site model or CSM that could apply to AFFF sites. Um, and so I'll briefly cover this in the next few slides. Um, I did show, when I showed that wide range of different structures, that um, I mentioned that they will have very different behaviors in the environment as well. And so um, that sort of determines their partitioning. Um, some of them have a higher affinity for the aqueous compartments of environments, and some are more drawn to sediment or um, soil. So we expect that when we have a, a site that's been um, contaminated with AFFF, we're going to find PFAS in all of these different abiotic media. Um, also, if AFFF has been discharged at your site and there was a need to use it, it's probably not a pristine site. Um, to begin with. So, um, keeping that in mind, um, we also think about the fact that if these are not pristine sites, we're discharging a triple F, they're probably somewhat industrial in nature. Um, there's probably not a lot of actual valuable habitat um, at the immediate point of discharge. And so, keeping in mind that um, a lot of these compounds are very water soluble um, and can spread throughout continuous aquifers, different compartments of water, you can have surface runoff, um, you can have nearby um, uh, surface waters impacted as well. So, uh, we really find that it's the off site systems that are the most affected. They have the highest sort of risk potential for ecological receptors. Um, and so, that is really what the guidance is sort of focused on. So once we've sort of reasoned through this conceptual site model and thought that our off-site habitats that are impacted by, indirectly by runoff or sort of influence from other nearby um, sites where there was an immediate discharge, we started thinking about what types of receptors we should be really looking at for the rest of the guidance. Um, and so we selected receptors of interest for both terrestrial systems, which the terrestrial model um, is sort of in development and forthcoming. Um, today we're focusing on the aquatic model. Uh, and so um, we, all, we have a, I guess I'll quickly go over uh, the terrestrial receptors um, and then I'll move on to the aquatic receptors and it'll be discussed in greater detail as well. So uh, when we think about terrestrial receptors at AFFF impacted sites, um, and we think about direct versus indirect exposure, it's more likely that plants um, and things that are in direct contact with soil like invertebrates are going to have that direct exposure. Whereas for wildlife that sort of rely on those, uh, um, those organisms as food items, they're going to have more exposure through dietary pathways. Although there will be some potential consumption of contaminated surface water or incidental ingestion of soil, things like that. Uh, for the most part, uh, these small terrestrial avian and wildlife, I'm sorry, and mammalian wildlife are typically exposed um, mostly through their, their diet. And that's true also for larger um, carnivorous birds and mammals as well. Um, but we find that because of a number of different sort of life history factors, as well as b different behavioral factors, um, which we'll get into more later, the uh, smaller mammalian wildlife and the avian species tend to drive risk at these sites. In aquatic environments, um, thinking about directly exposed organisms versus those that are exposed through the food web or indirectly, um, we're going to generally see that if there's PFAS in the water, there's also going to be PFAS uptake directly into fish um, and into also the sediment associated. PFAS can be um, directly taken up by uh, sediment associated benth uh, benthic organisms as well as anything that's feeding on them. Um, and so we can have also pelagic um, invertebrates can uptake directly from the water as well. And so um, 
when we start to think about the larger sort of avian and mammalian species that are dependent on these aquatic organisms for their food sources, that's when the um, sort of food web exposure becomes really important, um, is in those avian and um, mammalian species that depend on aquatic environments for their food. Again, you can have um, some sediment exposure directly through incidental ingestion during foraging, or you can have you know consumption of contaminated surface water, but those tend to be um, much more minor relative to the dietary exposure. So for the conceptual site model that we sort of have developed for the guidance document, um, the major takeaways are that off-site habitats really are the habitats that have the highest risk profile when you have an AFFF discharge. Um, because uh, PFAS can be so mobile in the environment, particularly those that are water soluble, um, you know, and also considering the characteristics of the discharge site itself, that it's probably not pristine habitat, um, we see that the, the nearby habitat that's valued by ecological receptors is really going to be of greater concern in your risk assessment. Okay, so next we'll be moving on to the um, exposure assessment component of the ERA. Um, and so here, um, we know, again, all sites are unique. And so there are certain minimum data requirements that each person has to have to sort of use this tool and use this guidance effectively. Um, and so for terrestrial sites and aquatic sites, those may vary somewhat. Um, you need to, at a minimum, have, for your terrestrial sites, you need to have measured concentrations of PFAS in your soil. Um, and you also need to have total organic carbon content of your soil um, to sort of put into the model. Um, I guess you. You don't have to, but it's very recommended to have that uh, total organic carbon measurement. For aquatic sites, um, again, we strongly recommend that you have not just water concentrations that are measured, but you also have sediment concentrations that are measured. Um, there are some additional um, different data types that you may wish to collect that could help improve or inform your model, um, like soil and groundwater data may be useful. You don't tend to think of groundwater as an exposure pathway for um, ecological receptors when doing risk assessment most of the time, but but in uh, the case where soil nearby is impacting your aquatic environment or if you're um, having runoff um, into your aquatic environment that's a major contributor of PFAS, that may also be helpful. Um, the other thing is different sediment parameters like total organic carbon of your sediment or um, also pore water. Um, but those, again, are sort of methods that are um, sort of newer and can be very interesting and helpful, um, but it's not as sort of well established to use them. So in addition to data type recommendations, there are also um, different recommendations that the guidance um, sort of outlines for the analytes themselves to use, as well as the analytical methods that are sort of best and most accepted best practices to use. So um, regarding the different analytical methods that um, the guidance recommends, it's EPA 537.1, um, and it covers these 14 PFAS here that are PFAS here that are in the red box. Um, and we also recommend adding um, four different, four additional uh, compounds, PFDS, PFOSA, PFBA, and PFPEA. Um, and they're not included in 537.1, but a lot of commercial labs have established and accepted methods to detect these compounds. Um, and I should also, I guess, add that although 537 is technically a sort of a drinking water method, um, a lot of labs have successfully modified it to measure um, PFAS and other different environmental compartments, including in biotic samples. Um, and I'll also add before moving on that, um, as we all know, this is a rapidly evolving topic and there are improvements to methods that are coming out very frequently. And so it's really important before these analyses are done to sort of check for updates, um, look at the ITRC website, the EPA website, and make sure that you're using the best and most recent and current methods that are available, um, just because there are improvements that are helping us detect new PFAS compounds, um, reduce cross-contamination, and also improve your detection limits. So um, a question of whether or not total PFAS can be used as um, sort of a representative value for an exposure assessment comes up pretty frequently because um, 
oftentimes an ecological risk assessment, like with PCBs or PHs, or I'm sorry, uh, TPHs, you are able to use sort of that sum value. Um, and so the answer to that is sort of on that slide with the different range of structures that these compounds can have. Um, they don't behave uh, sort of similarly enough to use that approach, generally speaking, for sort of risk-based decisions. Um, and so it's, uh, even if we had perfect analytical procedures um, that could give us a great you know, value to use as sort of a sum, it's generally not accepted as a good uh, sort of proxy to use in your risk evaluation. Um, sort of a related topic that's been getting a lot of attention is the total oxidizable precursor assay, or the top assay. Um, and this is sort of a procedure where you take your environmental samples, you split it apart, um, one is strongly oxidized in the lab, and the other one is run as is, and then you sort of compare the different concentrations of your PFAS of interest between the two to see um, how the oxidation of those those precursor compounds that may be present in the environment change the ultimate concentration of PFAS in your, your media of interest. And so um, while that can be really useful and have some applications where it's helpful information and really appropriate, it's not currently recommended for use in risk assessments. It's still sort of being looked at. And that's, I think, largely because what happens under controlled laboratory conditions with a strong oxidizing agent isn't necessarily what you're gonna see happening in the natural environment. And so it may not give you a particularly accurate um, representation of what you can expect your biota to be exposed to. So um, the exposure assessment, when we first start looking at our group of um, contaminants and we're uh, about to proceed through the steps, we're going to do an exposure assessment. It's going to require a lot of time and energy. Um, most of the time, we ask ourselves, do I really need to do this whole eco-risk assessment or, or not? And so for with a lot of other compounds, our first step, or a lot of other contaminant classes, I should say, a first step is to compare our site-specific data to screening levels that have been established. Um, unfortunately, that's not the case with PFAS because we don't have any nationally or state promulgated screening levels that can be used for ecological risk assessment. Um, and for that reason, we sort of have to use our abiotic media concentrations that have been collected to try and make these decisions on our own. And so the, um, the guidance sort of outlines different conditions that when they're met, um, should probably proceed to a full ecological risk assessment. And so those, those conditions that are sort of outlined is, um, is there a presence of PFAS that is distributed throughout the environment and is being detected in a high enough frequency um, that you're pretty sure that the site is impacted? Um, an, another condition that should be met is, um, is this habitat of sufficient size and quality that it can support either a population of common species or is it supporting T and E species, which would require more conservatism? Um, and so the third is, is there a exposure pathway that's connecting those receptors to the source of the PFAS. And so if you have a complete exposure pathway and you can connect A to B, um, it's probably time to start proceeding through additional evaluation. So um, for aquatic life, um, with our fish, our pelagic and our benthic invertebrates, and um, as well as soil life, um, those things that have direct exposures from their environment and direct uptake, uh, really what we're doing is we're comparing the concentrations in whatever media they're exposed to, either the, the aqueous environment, the sediments, the soil, um, directly to values that we know are causing um, toxicological effects in sort of the studies that have acceptable study criteria and are of high value. Um, and so, Jason or Jen will be going through those later, um, actually, so stay tuned for that. Um, and for vertebrate wildlife, um, those higher trophic level organisms, 
it's going to rely more heavily on those indirect exposure pathways and modeling concentrations in their food and dietary exposures. And so um, this will all be covered later as we, in greater detail as we move into the model tool section. Um, but I do want to point out it's that standard dietary intake equation that's being used um, that considers sort of what kind of exposure these uh, organisms are going to be experienced based on their diet. So these are the exposure parameters, just some examples of common exposure parameters that you're going to use in your ecological risk assessments. I'm sure most of us, if not all, have um, searched for these before. Um, and we've probably all searched in similar places. So these are some of the common sources that are you know, go-to places for these parameters um, to use in our modeling. Um, there's, of course, the the more readily available and widely distributed like wildlife factors handbook and then there's also a number of peer-reviewed papers that have been sort of foundational in eco risk, risk assessment that are listed up here as well so um, the guidance is that uh, has been developed um, is sort of intended to focus on ecological risk assessment for vertebrate wildlife species so those ones that are exposed through the food web um, and so the guidance is translatable to common species, um, but it does have a focus on t and &E species. Fortunately, the underlying concepts are broadly enough applied that it can be easily adapted to both, and the guidance does a pretty good job of sort of outlining where those differences are. Um, and so just quickly, um, some of the main differences between doing an ERA for a t and &E species versus a common species is um, the values you're going to use. So are you doing your lowest observable effect concentration or are you using your no observable effect concentration? Um, there's going to be an added degree of conservatism when you are uh, looking at risk for a protected organism versus a common species. The most important thing, though, besides that difference is that you're selecting the most appropriate receptor for your site specifically. So um, we've included in the model, which Jen will cover later, um, some more commonly used receptors to get you started. Um, and there are uh, sort of some t and &E species included in that as well. And that is um, true for aquatic mammals and birds. So these are just examples of some of the species that were included in the model tool um, that includes sort of your more common receptors versus your, your protected individuals. Um, and then for the terrestrial model that is currently in development, um, here are some examples of the species that um, all of those exposure parameters are already available in the model. Um, they self-populate and it's um, very helpful. They can um, be used as surrogate organisms to sort of represent receptors that are you know, more important and relevant to your site. Um, and so we hope that that will be very useful for people. And um, as a final thought, the guidance really does focus on small, low, tro low trophic level wildlife, so those mammalian receptors and um, the avian species, and there are a number of reasons for that. Um, these organisms have high site fidelity, so they're feeding in a smaller area. They're probably going to be more highly exposed to contaminated dietary items. Um, and we know that because PFAS is so ubiquitously distributed, that small home range ensures that they're probably being exposed to PFAS. That is from the source of interest to you. Um, they also have a higher dietary intake relative to their body mass. So um, that, again, will help sort of increase the risk factors for, for this category. Um, also. The um, models that are used to sort of estimate exposure for larger carnivorous mammals and birds um, are sort of uh, still in development. They're not, they're a little more complicated uh, because of those larger home ranges, factors like that. Um, and they're sort of still, I think, being refined. So um, for that reason, these smaller mammals and smaller avian species are the ones that tend to drive these risk decisions at um, PFAS-impacted sites.